I want to talk to you about soul travail today, about prayer. Because we've got to turn America. Are you in on this? How many of you are, are in on this? We have got to turn America, even if it's just this church. We're responsible for our own lives. I remember studying Reese Howells, the intercessor. And we visited his, uh, his home in Wales. It was a remarkable place. He forged it out of nothing, nothing but faith in Jesus. But when t World War II came along and Hitler was winning the war, the Lord spoke to Reese Howells and said, turn Hitler. In other words, he said, defeat Hitler. Now God's saying to us, defeat communism and Marxism and rioting and anarchy and rebellion. Now he's turning to us and saying that. Have you received your commission? Tell me, raise your hand if you received this commission. It's for every single one of us. Nobody's exempt unless you want to live under communism. So, what did he do? Do you remember in Acts 4? Says the disciples returned to their own spiritual company. Everybody has to have a spiritual company where they understand one another. We understand the, the spirit-filled life based on the word of God in this church, don't we? We all understand that. You're in your spiritual company. Those disciples and apostles, after they were beaten and taken to task for worshiping Jesus, they returned to their own spiritual company, and then they prayed together, and the whole building was shaken where they were. Now, we've got to shake America by our prayers. We have got to get a hold of God and change America because we know how to do it. Because we have the Holy Ghost and he's the best teacher on earth and in heaven. So, Reese Howells got three, four, five other men. And they gathered in his blue room. We looked through the windows and saw the blue room. We couldn't go in there because they were doing some renovation at the time. We saw the blue room. The blue room was like a piece of heaven coming down on earth where men of like faith met to turn World War II and change the course of the entire world by getting a hold of God. Do you have lofty dreams like this? Or do you have selfish little teeny tiny pygmy dreams of just me, myself, and I? You're going to have to get rid of that mentality now, we turn America now or we lose America. We're at that place right now. And we're not only responsible for that, we are responsible to God for bringing, by our prayer and our fasting and our pleading and our supplication before God, we are responsible to bring the great awakening down in this city. We'll start in this city and then we'll pray it down everywhere but we've got to turn this city because of what's going on in this city. Are you with me? Yes. And really the question is, are you with Jesus Christ on this? Because yes. I received my orders from headquarters. That's our next project, is to turn anarchy, Antifa, out of this city. And I've told you this vision I had 10, 15 years ago, maybe as many as 20 years ago. It's in my journals, the date. In a night vision. You can't control what you're seeing in a night vision because you're asleep. It was a night vision. And I went to someone's apartment that overlooked the city. They really did have an apartment that overlooked the city. And I went to that apartment in the night vision. And I'm looking over all of downtown Portland. And we had been at a play by our childhood girlfriend. Her daughter was in a play about a week or two before that. And at that play, we're sitting in there, we were sitting in the bleachers watching her young doc, daughter, 
perform her role in this play. And I was just almost in ecstasy because here's my girlfriend, now it's her daughter. And I was just so thrilled watching this little girl in this play. And then God spoke to me. And he says, cherish these days for they shall never come again. Cherish these days for they shall never come again. For even now the storm clouds are fomenting. In fact, right after that was 9-11. So that was the time frame. So that happened, 9-11. Even now, the storm clouds are fomenting. And then, when 9-11 happened, I said, God, what is this? What is this? What is this all about? And he said, jihad. And I said, what's jihad mean? He said, religious wars. And so for days I heard jihad, religious wars. Jihad, religious wars. Two brothers that fought in the Bible and their feud has now gone out into the world. So then, fast forward just a little bit, and now I'm in the night vision. And I see Clouds fomenting. He said, even now the clouds are fomenting. Cherish these days for they shall never come again. Those were carefree, carefree days. We'd go blueberry picking and, you know, just have wonderful fellowship with other like believers. Not a care in the world. So in the night vision, I'm seeing the clouds come from the north. Big, black, big, black clouds. They weren't little guys. And from the south, come and foment, and they start stacking something up. Ominous, 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 stacking something huge up. I see feet being formed. Then I see massive black legs, storm cloud legs being formed. Then I see the torso of this huge giant, worse than Goliath, to be honest. Then I see the arms, the shoulders being formed, and then the head. And I see the appearance of a monster. A monster standing in front of me in downtown Portland. His head is as high as the top of the West Hills and beyond. He's so huge. His teeth are jagged, just ready to rip, tear, and devour. I can still see him now. His claws are long talons, ready to rip, tear, and devour. And he starts hurtling curses to the city of Portland. Curses and curses and curses. And everybody flees and leaves downtown. Downtown is barren. And I woke up and I said, God, what is this? What is this? What is this God? And he said, it's terrorism. This is what it is, terrorism. When you have a night vision like that, you can go back into the night vision sometimes and see what you saw and now we know. And there be, may be more. But if David could quell Goliath, with five smooth stones. Do you know what those five smooth stones were? Nope. It was his words. His words. I come in the name of the Lord God Almighty to take off your head. That's what his five smooth stones were. He spoke the word of the Lord to that foul giant. And this is what we have to do is speak the word of the Lord to that giant. And... Everything is the word and the spirit. You pray red hot on fire so that when you speak, those words are red hot on fire and they go out and destroy. They destroy the bad thing that's coming against a city or a nation. Well, now we're here. So we have to get down into a place of travail I want you to listen to this. If you travail, 
Travail is deep soul prayer. You usually do it in your prayer language, but you can also do it in English. Deep soul travail, where you travail in tongues deeply, deeply, deeply. This is soul travail. If you travail in the secret place of the Most High, I want you to hear me. This is key to your life. This is key to your success. This is key to going to heaven with rank and position with Jesus Christ. What does a person win who does what they're supposed to do on earth? They win Jesus Christ, a, a more exalted place of honor with him, greater fellowship with him, a more of a closeness with them because they died to self on earth. And they didn't go the way of the world. And they couldn't bear to fellowship or buddy up with unclean people. They sure didn't go into fornication, lust, perversion, drinking, and the like. They couldn't bear that because they measure everything about their relationship with Jesus Christ in heaven, on earth, but also in heaven. There is a place with Jesus to be gained in heaven, and it'll take being a warrior on earth. If you travail, deep soul travail, if you travail in the secret place of the Most High, you can prevail anywhere in life at any time. Did you hear that? If you will travail in your prayer language, in English, in groanings and utterances, if you travail in your prayer language and in English, in the secret place of the Most High God, you can prevail in life anywhere at any time because you fought the battle in prayer. You fought it in prayer. David fought it with his whole lifestyle. All the singing unto God, the worshiping unto God. That's where he fought it. And then God gave him some, or some, how do you say, some practicums, the lion and the bear. So David knew and was ready for his Goliath. I hope you've fought some battles in the spirit. I hope you've rendered down that giant Goliath that was before you, whatever it was. We got a Goliath to go after, Chris. You and me. We got a Goliath to go after. Capiche? We do. Prevail means to be or prove superior in strength, power, or influence. And you do it in prayer first. To succeed or to win out, to plead your case successfully with God, to be able to have the power, resilience, great power with God. It's can, it's might, it's attainment. It's to be endued with power from on high. I want you to look at Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, tarry. Now he told the early disciples, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out yet, to tarry in the city of Jerusalem. We don't have to do that. They did that. The Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. Now, Jesus is telling us, tarry before God in the secret place of the Most High in your prayer language, in crying and moaning and beseeching earnestly for God's mighty hand to come down upon you and upon this city and upon the Christians in this city so that we can prevail in this city in life anywhere at any time. We've got to win it in the spirit. All failure in life is a prayer failure. All failure in life is a prayer failure. That's why when I had a skirmish, when I was just filled with the spirit, with two Satanists, they moved in next door and they went after me. And they went after me for my death. And I was in a motorcycle accident. I was, on, I was riding the motorcycle. Did I know how to ride a motorcycle? Oh no, that would have been too simple. <laughs> Jumped on that motorcycle and pshaw, 
down the street. Anyway, as I'm, I turned the corner too far, the car and that other lane came and got in my lane. I got control of the bike, went in my lane, and he hits me in my lane. Right as I'm driving toward, there were unseen hands on my hands. I could not turn that motorcycle for anything. And I heard the voice of an angel, and I saw him with my spirit, and he said, come up hither. And when I threw him my spirit, the only reason I wasn't killed was because I threw him my spirit. So when I hit that bike, my spirit wasn't there. It was only my body. What I'm saying to you is, listen, when I went to the hospital in the course of days, my leg was badly broken. Jesus had them give me a white blank or a white rug, a beautiful white rug. And I said, what's this for? They didn't give it to anybody else. Jesus said, if you had prayed and travailed in the spirit, this never would have happened to you. Even though they were living next door doing all kinds of spells and incantations. He said, it never would have happened to you. I had to learn the hard way. If you travail in prayer, you can prevail any place else. So God is going to show us secret counsels. Jeremiah 23, 22. If they had stood in my counsel, they would have caused my people to hear my words and they would have turned from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Now we have got to turn America. Reading the news is like reading a horror story. All the debauchery. But first, we're going to humble ourselves before God because this is one of the main things you do when you go to prayer is you make yourself very, very small so Jesus can be very, very great. Because if you go to him big, he'll let you be big, but you won't get anything done. Now, when Reese Howells gathered those men in his blue room, they started praying. They prayed, I believe, from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock every single night. And their goal, their assignment was to turn Hitler. Our assignment is to rout the enemy out of this city and to pray down the Great Awakening. That's our assignment. Do you receive it? You got to get on your prayer bones for it. So Reese Howler, Howells and those men started praying. And in one of the battles, it looked like Hitler was going to take all of Europe. But in one of the battles, Hitler made a big mistake. And he was positioned to take out our troops in a certain place. He was, he was positioned, he was in position to go in and ravage all those troops and kill them all. And guess what? Because of the prayers of these five men, God brought in such a cloud, a storm, a cloud storm that was so bad, the enemies couldn't see anything. They couldn't get anything done. They had to go away. And our troops were saved. We've got to move God's hand. He wants, he wants to move his hand, but he's waiting for a few good people to start praying. We are people of the word. You use the word and the spirit. When people don't use the word of God, they can get off. And they can get into an arena where they're listening to familiar spirits. You have to hear me on this. I have run across this in counseling. So many times over the word, you ask them, well, do you read the word? I mean, what are you basing this prayer on? Well, I mean, I don't really read the word all that much, but you know, I'm different. I've heard this. I'm different. God talks to me personally. Yeah, he talks to me personally too. First in his word and then by his spirit. So they get off with listening to familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are spirits that are familiar with a person. They get to know their likes, dislikes, their weaknesses, their proclivities in life. And they lead and guide them apart from the word of God. This is so dangerous. And you could tell a person with a familiar spirit, there's just something kind of wonky about them. Do you know what I'm saying? Just something a little off. You love them, but there's something off. Use the word of God as your primer, as your textbook. 
where you get your strength from. It's word and then it's spirit. And we're gonna get this job done. I want you to remember Jesus in travail. Jesus travailed, Paul travailed. Jesus, Mark 14. Jesus told his disciples, do you remember? He said, watch and pray. We're supposed to be watching and praying. How do you do that? You put your spiritual antenna up. You pray so much in the spirit and you got your Bible open and you're in the word of God so that your spiritual antenna receives the messages from the Lord. What to do, when to do it, and how to do it. You just tune into him. You got a frequency with Jesus and the Holy Ghost and Father God. And you tune out to the bad frequencies in this world because you're not of that realm, you're of the heavenly realm. Jesus said, watch and pray. He said it to them twice, three times. They kept falling asleep. And so Jesus went off and prayed. His crucifixion had to be prayed out so that he wouldn't buckle. Now the closest he got to it was when he said, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. That's how, I mean, he was, he's God. He was pure. He was perfect. But his own crucifixion had to be prayed out, and he was left alone to do it. And he did it such a remarkable job that he sweat great drops of blood so he could perform the will of God. Now, God isn't saying to us that we have to sweat great drops of blood. But I'm telling you, there's work to travail. There is very great work to travail. You don't stay at it five minutes, 10 minutes. Jesus said as he was praying that he was exceedingly sorrowful. Sometimes when you're in that kind of travail, you cry, you, you, you're in anguish. And sometimes you know what you're praying about and sometimes you don't. But he knew that something had to be prayed out, his own crucifixion, because afterwards, when he went back to the disciples, he said, it is enough. In other words, he did it, and he did it by himself. Jesus isn't doing it all by himself. Yes, Jesus travails for each one of us in heaven, but he's not doing all the travailing anymore. The body of Christ is. The problem why our country has gotten so off is people aren't travailing in deep soul travail anymore. They aren't using the word of God as their guide. If they did, they couldn't do a fraction of the things they're doing because the Bible is very clear on this. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps us in our weaknesses. Helps. Notice that word, helps. He doesn't do it all. Years ago, a little woman says, Somebody asked her, her pastor says, well, how are you doing? How's, how's your prayer life? She says, oh, I don't pray anymore. Not since I got the Holy Ghost. He does all the praying, I don't pray. Well, that's nonsense. He takes hold together with us for our prayer petition. So the Holy Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we are. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We can't pray out tomorrow, but he can. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That word helps is a Greek word, son anti lambrano. It means to take hold together with you. So when you start praying in tongues, the Holy Ghost goes and grabs what the assignment of the Lord is. And on the inside of you, together, you and the Holy Ghost move it. You move it. You get it out of the way. You take it out of existence. You make it of none effect with the help of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 4.19. My little children of whom I travail, which means labor. I travail for you. I labor in birth until Christ be formed in you. One of the best things God ever did in my life, as soon as I got filled with the Spirit, he told me to start travailing in the spirit. I could only pray five minutes in tongues. And I was exhausted. I called my sister. She lived in California. They were on an archaeological dig. And she said, well, I pray two hours in tongues. I worship two hours in tongues. And then I'm in the Bible two hours. And I thought, I'm an infant. I can only pray five minutes. 
And so the Lord challenged me and said, you start praying one hour every day in tongues and then you go up from there. The way this church started was we got on a daisy chain of people, probably about five, <clears throat> six people maybe, and we prayed 12 hours. 12 hours. It was the easiest thing in the world. You have to exercise your spiritual muscle to go higher and deeper in Christ, lost in the spirit. Remember Ezekiel 47, wherever the river goes, it brings life and it brings cleansing. The Holy Spirit brings cleansing. I want to tell you a true story that happened when I was kind of a kid in the Lord. It's important because you can travail about the most impossible thing and it will come to pass. We lived in a certain place in Portland. And the Lord spoke to us when we were young. My sister and I were young and told us that our parents, our family, that we were to start a prayer meeting. So we started a prayer meeting every Monday night, seven o'clock. That prayer meeting went for 12 years until I went off to Ramah and then my sister and mother and father and somebody else they continued it until she went off to Ramah. God trained me to get on my knees by my bed. Now you can pray and travail any way you want to, but I enjoyed getting on my knees before God beside my bed and I started travailing. He taught me to work up, go greater and greater and greater and greater in tongues until I was lost in the spirit and I received his assignment from heaven. Sometimes I knew his assignment and sometimes I didn't, but I still prayed it out, whatever it was, sometimes not even knowing what it was. And so I would go into this place of power, invincible power in the Holy Ghost, where you had a hold of something, it didn't matter if you knew what it was or not, and you turned it, you changed it, you brought it down, you brought it subject to the name of Jesus. And so that was my habit, many, many days doing that. When I didn't have to go to work, I held down a job when I didn't have to go to work. Sometimes I'd do it in the evening. Well, one day at, in the prayer meeting, and I want you to listen to this. One day in the prayer meeting, a man came into the prayer meeting. I'd never seen him. He had bright carrot red hair, bright bushy carrot red eyebrows. He came into the prayer meeting. We held probably 35, sometimes 40 people in that living room at my parents' house. Just everybody came from everywhere. I don't know. They came out of the woodwork. We never advertised, ever, but they just came. They got delivered. They got set free, filled with the Holy Ghost, saved, all manner of things because we were praying in travail. This man walks through the door and I'm seated there, mother and father, my sister, all the other people, and he starts yelling, you're the one, you're the one, you're the woman, you're the woman, you're the woman. You know, that would kind of be disconcerting. I thought, what have I done now? <laughs> and so we said, you know, and he was yelling. It was not a small thing, he was yelling. And we said to him, what are you talking about? And he said, I've got to tell you my story. He said, I was a Satanist. He said, in fact, I was so high up, I was a wizard. He wasn't messing around. He was after the things of Satan, of the devil. He said, he was so brilliant, and he was, he was a brilliant, brilliant man that they asked him to join Mensa. If you know Mensa, it's a club for geniuses. So he belonged to Mensa, but he was a, a wizard and he was very high up in spiritual power. And he said, so I'm just minding my own business doing the will of the, the devil. And he said, I see this light coming after me, this big, huge ball of light and it starts chasing me down. He says, I can look and I can see this big ball of light chasing me down and I'm terrified because I don't like the light, I like 
the darkness. And he says, so I run as fast as I can. And the light chases me down, runs right after me. And I look behind the light and I see a wee woman on her knees in prayer, in soul travail. Praying with all of her heart and all of her soul in tongues. He knows now what that was, praying in tongues. And he said, I'm terrified. I see the light. I see the wee woman on her knees praying in tongues. He said, so I run. I try to outrun the light. I run as fast as I can. Then I turn the corner and I duck the corner and I go down an alleyway trying to evade the light. And the light comes to where I turn and makes a turn and comes right after me, that big ball of light. And so I go and hide. I hide under things. I try desperately to get away from the big ball of light. Every place I go, it hunts me down. I don't want the light. I hate the light. I love the darkness. Now, when you love darkness, that's not a good thing. He said, I did everything in my power to evade the light. I ran as fast as I could, every place I could find, to dunk, duck in, duck in a doorway, hide, hide in a manhole, so to speak. Everything to get away and evade the light. And he said, I kept looking back, kept seeing that wee woman on her knees in prayer. She was just little, not very big. But the prayer was huge. And from that prayer was being emitted this huge ball of light. And I ran and ran and ran. This took days and weeks and months. He kept running and running and running to evade that light. And he couldn't evade it. Every place he went, that big ball of light was coming after him. He said, finally, one day, After weeks and months of running, the ball of light just engulfed me and captured me. Just captured me. Just came into me and captured me. And he said, I met Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I was born again. I was totally captured by the light, and now I love Jesus Christ. Now I adore Jesus Christ. And then he got filled with the Spirit. I have no idea how he found the house. I have no idea who brought him. I have no idea how he got there. None. I've never have known that answer. Nobody brought him. He just showed up. He just showed up. So he came to the prayer meeting. I think that's where he got filled with the Spirit. Is that the prayer meeting? We got him filled with the Holy Ghost. Now this man who was causing so much trouble to the kingdom of God is now serving Jesus. In the course of time, God calls me to go off to Bible school, and God calls him to go off to Bible school. And so, he's in that prayer meeting that whole time, and now he wants to go to Bible school. He's radically changed. Now he's so on fire for God. He's He's just an amazing man. An amazing, brilliant man. And so, in the course of time, we, we were in that prayer meeting 12 years until I had to leave for Bible school. I go down to Ramah, go to Bible school. He follows me down to Tulsa. I didn't know he was going to go to Tulsa. He didn't go to Ramah. He went to another Bible school. Then, I have to go to Ramah by faith. I'm not allowed to work because God wants to teach me faith. So, guess what? What you sow, you reap. My mother always used to say this to me when I was a little kid and did naughty things, she would say, whatever, she called me Annie, Annie, whatever you sow into the lives of others will come back into your own. Whatever you sow good will too. So now I'm down in Bible school, I have to go by faith, I don't know faith right yet, so I'm learning it, so I'm hungry all the time. Guess what God says to this man, let's call him Sam. God says, I want you to be her daddy. I want you, because he worked and he made a lot of money, she sa- he said, I want you to be her daddy and I want you to go and open your wallet and give her money every week so she can eat. Because I had no way to eat. And so 
he now was my daddy, he would come over to my apartment, he'd open his billfold, his wallet, and he'd bring out the 20s. And that's how I ate. You sow it, you're going to reap it. You change somebody's life, God will cause them to raise up as a banner in the heavenlies and change this world. Now, this is a litmus test for me. What can be changed by prayer, by deep soul to fire? This man was unreachable. If you could have seen him like I saw him in the spirit, he was unreachable, untenable, because he was so deep in darkness and so high up in darkness. Nobody could reach him. Echelons of darkness. There are echelons. There are stairways. Echelons of darkness. He was high up. Nobody could reach him but the Holy Ghost. But look, God needed somebody to pray him in. Somebody, anybody, just a wee little puny, stinking little girl to pray him in. It doesn't take a big, magnificent giant in prayer. Just somebody who's willing to pray out salvation for other people. Pray out this city to turn. Do you see what I'm saying? God will use anybody. Look at using somebody that of no account. I was nobody. All he needs is a vessel who will pray out the plan of God, the mystery of the plan of God for this city and then the United States and the election and everything else good and godly. Who's going to sign up for it? I want you to stand if you're going to sign up for it. 